still, are we all ready to go, uh, Caitlin? Uh, yeah, we've got all the attendees. Uh, we're letting attendees in currently. Um, and people might also trickle in. So I'm gonna give uh, Richie, yeah, the ready. Just checking that we're good to go. All right, I am just gonna start my intro. Hello, hopefully we are live on HowlRound. Uh, hi everyone, welcome to Reimagine Theater, a panel series that brings artists and community leaders together to envision a new theatrical world. My name is Nebra Nelson and I'm the Director of Arts Engagement at Seattle Rep and my pronouns are she and her. I'll give a brief physical description of myself for blind and low vision audience members. I am a light-skinned uh, brown woman with short brown hair, wearing a multicolored shirt and a gold necklace. And behind me are, uh, is a white wall with black and white photos. I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the Coast Salish people here in Seattle, including the Duwamish people past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. This acknowledgement, of course, does not take the place of authentic relationships with indigenous communities, but serves as just a first step in honoring the land that we're on. Uh, for more resources on how to support local indigenous communities, please visit the land acknowledgement page on the Seattle Rep website. I really deeply appreciate each of these panelists being here to have this conversation. I know they're all incredibly busy folks and all parents themselves, uh, or mostly parents themselves here. We're doing these panels so that we can envision what a future of equity and justice looks like and how the arts and theater should be a part of that and be a consistent part of community voice. The leading questions for this discussion are, if you could wave a magic wand and build a new theater landscape, what would you create? What does theater at the heart of public life look like? And what would a theat theatrical processes and organizations look like if they were fully supportive of parents in all stages and structures of parenthood? People in the Zoom audience, please think about your answers to these questions since we're going to invite you to be a part of the conversation and join the discussion actively at the end of the panel. And in the meantime, you can react and ask questions in the chat box. This panel is in partnership with Bushwick Book Club's concert based on Angela Garb's book, Like a Mother. That concert is taking place on Saturday, May 22nd at 7.30 p.m. and will feature monologues about motherhood from previous Seattle rep shows uh, done by local actors, including our panelist tonight, Faith Russell. You can get your tickets at thebushwickbookclubseattle.com. Now I'm going to pass it to my co-facilitator for this panel, Jasmine Joshua, and the rest of the panelists to in introduce themselves briefly. Hi, my name is Jasmine Joshua. I use they, them pronouns. I am also from, uh, uh, speaking on Duwamish land. Uh, thank you, Narbra, for that uh, acknowledgement. Um, I am a white person wearing a light blue shirt with dyed reddish hair. Behind me is a mess. <laughs> Um, and probably there will be a black and white cat who will likely walk across my face several times during uh, this talk. Um, and I am going to pass it to uh, Veronica Wilhelm. Hi, I'm Veronica Wilhelm. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and um, I'm a organizational development consultant. I'm so excited to be here. I'm a light-skinned person with dark hair um, and I have a green plaid shirt on. Behind me are um, bookcases that are teal with rainbow order books among other tchotchkes. Um, yeah, and do I need anything else for that, Jasmine? I think that's the whole intro, cool. Okay, well then I'm gonna pass it to Sarah. Hello, my name is Sarah Russell. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I am a, a black woman uh, with kind of long, wavy, blondish, brownish -ish hair. Uh, my background, I, I'm at work, so I have a glass wall behind me where you can see a couple 
chairs and I'm wearing a, a black shirt that you can't fully tell, but I'm wearing a Black Panther t-shirt, uh, Wakanda Forever. Uh, and I'm going to pass it to Jess. Thanks, Sarah. My name is Jess Spencer. My pronouns are she, her. I am the artistic associate and casting director at Village Theater. I am a white skinned woman and I have dark brown hair. I'm wearing a rainbow striped shirt and a gray cardigan. And I'm in a predominantly white background room until I move. And then you get to see a dresser with a lot of books and mess and additional tchotchkes on it. Um, very grateful to be here today. And I will pass this to Faith. Thank you, Jess. I was so enraptured with your room. I had to unmute myself. Um, so happy to be here. My name is Faith Bennett Russell. I use she, her pronouns. I uh, am a 35 year theater professional as an actor, director, um, teaching artist, playwright, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I am an African-American caramel colored woman. I have what I call Beyonce blonde hair which she took from me. I'm not complaining, but I'm just saying. Um, I'm in my dining room. Don't tell her I said that or the beehive. They'll scratch my eyes right out. Um, I'm in my dining room um, with beige and white pictures of sorts. I collect teapots. If I was able to scan to my left, there's flowers and also various teas. Jasmine, come on over for tea sometime. I can see you looking. Um, and again, so, so happy to be here. And I'm going to pass it to, I'm probably not going to say Miss Puck Suplenty, passing it to you. I am Mix Puck Suplenty. My pronouns are they, them, yes, queen. They aren't preferred, they are, please and thank you. And I am a burlesque performer and producer in the Seattle area. And I am the chair, board chair of the newly formed Seattle Burlesque and Cabaret Co-op here in Seattle, which now operates the Give In, which was formerly the Copious Love Space. Thank you to Copious Love for the generous gift of the space. And um, a brief description of me, I am a black non-binary human. I am wearing black glasses that have leopard print on the edges. I'm wearing a black t-shirt with white print that says, um, Social Justice Rogue by Any Means Necessary. And I'm wearing a black and white cardigan that is houndstooth print. And I have a flower in my hair that is also black and white houndstooth print. And my background is a rhinestoned white shelf and a white wall with the black feather fan there in the corner. And is it Alyssa? I'm always the last one <laughs> because no one knows how to say my name. Thanks, mom. <laughs> uh, it's A Lisa, so with a big A. Uh, my friend said, one who came from New York, he's like, just think of like, hey, Lisa, you're A Lisa. That's how you say it. <laughs> I am a light skinned lady with blonde hair. Um, have a hat on. My daughter said, why are you wearing a cowboy hat, mom? Uh, I like hats. Yeah, I have some blue earrings, a, an orangish, reddish, rusty shirt, I suppose. Um, behind me is, well, too many pianos and some guitars and a drum and some lights on a fake wall. This wall was really gross before, but I found this uh, drape that makes it look like barn wood. So that was like $12. Good good purchase and a couple plants. Um, I am the development director for Bushwick Northwest and I also run the choral program at Inglemore High School and I teach um, songwriting and guitar and piano and I'm also the music director of the musicals there. Um, and I help run the Women in Music Collect Collective and I sing in the Maggie Ensemble, which I may talk about because I love them. I think that's all, is that all? Okay. Lovely, thank you all so much. I'll, I'll pass it to Jasmine, who will really be lead facilitating this panel uh, as our parent facilitator representative. Take it away, Jasmine. Hello. 
Hello, friends. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm so excited. I love this conversation because um, while I have had it a couple of times, it is always different because parenting, th there's a thing that connects all of us and that is the experience of raising other human beings. But everyone comes at it from a different perspective and I, I love, and sometimes I, I, he, I also love hearing other people say things that I'm like, oh yeah, that thing that I never thought of, but I do <laughs> and that I feel. So let's start with our first question and dive right in. And which I believe was, if you could wave a magic wand and start everything over, <laughs> what would you... How would you how would you rebuild, especially with a from a, the lens of a parent? And I think we can just popcorn this, or I can force one of you to do it. <laughs> My Spanish teacher in high school used to say "voluntarios o víctimas." <laughs> that was her line. She was I, mean, right. I can I can please start. Veronica go. I have so many opinions about this. Um, Tell me everything. Uh, well, first of all, the, just the, the culture of theater, I, I wrote a whole master's thesis on it, like the culture of theater and the culture of like martyrdom around your job. And like for the, the American workplace, that's like key to how we operate. It's like martyrdom within the work that we do. And so one of the things that I, I keep thinking the we are when when I had my son, I my husband and I were the last ones in our friend group or within the crew that he was on. He was the master electrician at the Seattle Repertory Theater. Um, we were the last ones to have kids, so we got to watch everyone else try and figure it out first, and then it was us. And one of the things I thought about was how he did a lot of um, advocating for himself, for me, and for our son in the process. And I was like, part of part of that was great just because he could do that. But also, man, it took a lot of trial and error, a lot of families and a lot of children who had to suffer first before he could figure out the right mix of um, advocacy to get what he needed. And so when I think about if I could kind of like rewrite everything, I would start by saying like, you know, I, I wish theater would except from the outset that we don't really have to be martyrs for the work that we do. We don't have to suffer at all hours of the day and night. We can actually integrate the science that we know about what makes people best, like, you know, not sleep depriving them along the way. Um, and the work will still get done. The work will still get done and it will still be beautiful and it will still be impactful. And you can still like actually support people in the way how they want to be supported. So if you can start by saying like, yeah, let's actually take into account that humans are the ones who are putting on theater and take humanity into account. I think that would, that would go a long way. And in the US in particular, I feel like we suffer from this martyrdom that it coincides with, with, you know, capitalism and how capitalism treats people like cogs in a machine. And the thing I think I, we got the benefit of by the time we got around to having our kid was, um, at that point, everyone else had like stripped away the cogness of their of their work. Like, they it became clear by the time we were I think we were had like the fifth or sixth kid in the in the Bagley crew. Um, uh, it was clear we were working with people at that point. So I'm most of my work I do is about like reminding people of humanity, reminding people of how like how humans are complex and how humans need a whole bunch of different support. So at the baseline, like stop treating people like cogs treat them like humans, use the science that we have that we know, like it's, it, it seems straightforward, but I feel like I have a lot of conversations that way about that. So you're welcome. Humanity first. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think that that, I mean, I feel like as parents, a lot of the cracks in the system we come up against um, because we aren't just thinking of ourselves. We also have like other people who aren't necessarily hired to do a gig, but are affected by the gig. Um, so yeah, that, and, and that culture of martyrdom is not just for, and like even like, that's also a thing that parents are supposed to do, right? Especially people who have uteruses and carry those children. Um, they are especially <laughs> required and asked and assumed 
to give up everything because why wouldn't you? You're, you're supposedly hardwired that way. Um, I mean, the amount of people who asked me, so you've had children, and especially you had, I have twins. You have twins? Well, you're going to, I'll be like, so you're going to give up theater, right? You're going to, you're done, right? That's it, right? And um, my, <laughs> my spouse who works in tech and is often male presenting, how many people asked them? The answer is zero. <laughs> the answer is absolutely not a single human being when our children were born ever, ever asked them if they were going to give up their career because of their children. Um, so like that martyrdom is like so ingrained, like as a parent who can bear children, but also in theater. So it's like this compounded. Um, Pucks, I would love your, uh, are like from a, like a burlesque, like freelance artist perspective, like how, how would you answer that question? Cause it's a little different than like a traditional. It is. Cause most of the burlesque folks are having children now ish. I came into burlesque. I was a grown ass human being. Excuse me. When I came, I was fully grown, came into burlesque and had uh, my, my, I've been in burlesque now for four years. So um, I have a kiddo with special needs, the whole, whole gambit. And so it was always treated um, by folks like it's my hobby. This is your hobby. Uh, and I'm like, oh, well, I mean, Okay, so I kind of bought into it a little bit, like, I'll get over this, like my need to take off my clothes to music um, on at, at various bars that will just, I just need to get this itch scratched and it's turned into like this whole, whole career. Um, yeah, you like, like run an empire now. It's like, I amazing. do. It's, it's, it's really awesome. every, every year it gets bigger than I expected. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I am a, I'm a single parent. I'm polyamorous. So I have a lot of extra support that other single parents probably wouldn't have. And I have a really good relationship with my son's father. So I have, I have sitters, like my kid has places to go, but I definitely know of other burlesque humans that like, you know, when they're like, I, I can't show up to the show. I don't have a sitter. And you, you hear like, you know, the producers grumbling and getting all shitty. And I'm just like, a lot of us, it, burlesque is such a fringe group of folks. And a lot of us who are really out here doing the grind um, are like estranged from our families or transplants or whatever. So like our support network is smaller. And so who you trust to watch your baby is huge, right? It's huge. And you're skipping across town to go do this show where you were gonna get maybe 50 bucks to do the thing. And now you're weighing, should I pay a hundred bucks to have a sitter come so I can go get 50 bucks and attempt to find parking on second Ave, you know, at 630, you know, it becomes a matter of like the thing that was already kind of a weird financial negative is becoming an, a bigger financial negative. Yes. And then you got to pay for parking. Right. Yeah. So it's this whole thing. So it's, it's really interesting watching that group of producers that were very kind of thumbs downy about folks who were having babies are now having babies right now. And so it's just, you know, and you hear folks say, we should have, you know, we should have like a babysitting tree and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, we should. <laughs> my yeah. kid's 11. Like, uh -huh. you know, at this point, I'm just like, who gonna watch my kid? My kid can watch himself now. It's very fascinating, especially with how, how we how little we get paid and how sexualized our, our particular part of the industry is. Um, the assumption is, is that like, from at least from the outside that you're gonna stop yeah. once you have a kid. Like, well, clearly you can't go and take your clothes off. You can't go gallivanting across the country to take your clothes off to music, no matter how artistic it is or, you know, what political message you're trying to make. That's not a responsible thing when you're a parent. My kid thinks I'm a superhero because of all the costumes. I run with it. Yeah, my kids love the amount of glitter. I I so I realize I didn't say anything that what I do. Uh, I run a theater company called Reboot Theater Company. Um, I also did drag for a while, which is how I met Pucks. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but my kids, like my like makeup kit with all that glitter, they're like, <gasps> they think it's the best. Um, but yes, yeah, absolutely. No, it's a very. I mean, especially since like you're going into bars, which are not like. 
you know, there's, they've been some times where, like, I've had to just, like, have my kids sit in the audience until someone could come pick them up, and you can't do, <laughs> you can't do that at a bar. They frown upon <laughs> minors. Um, so, like, you can't, you know, it's, it, it, there's, like, a whole other level that's shut down. So even, you know, I mean, I could be wrong, um, but I, I don't even know, you're the only burlesque troupe I know that even has a venue that you could even have like jurisdiction over yeah so like our venue we have a bar in our venue but it we have it's all sectioned off but like yeah you can't take your kid i think the the interesting thing about covid right is like i've been able to uh go to different theater spaces to record and uh my kid has come with me and i'm like hey you can sit in this back area and all of that while this is happening uh my son has never watched me do burlesque until covid um, he asked, he's like, I would like, I want to see this act that you're doing. Cause this is amazing. I just wait what's going on. And so, um, I really kind of had to wrestle with that. Like, I, yeah. you know, like, like how raunchy is this thing I'm doing? Is it raunchy? It's not raunchy. Okay, let's go. You can see this. It's fine. What's the car ride on the way home? Right. Like, and my do son's I feel just like, like <laughs> I think it's really interesting that you picked that song. I'm on a boat. I love Lonely Island. And I'm just like, oh, that song has a lot of F bombs. Whoops. You know, so it's, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of that like picking your battles. Right. But yeah, you can't really just like take your kid to the bar. Right. You can't do that. And the cool thing about having the space right now, like where we're trying to like redo it and all of that is that my son can come. So my son is going to come down and help us paint the space Aww. so that he can have that, have that, that time with it. But it's, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. There's no other burlesque group right now. Um, from what I understand the past 50 years to actually uh, operate a venue for burlesquers by burlesquers. So that's amazing. It's kind of a big deal, but it's, as parents, there's several of us who are parents and several of us who are like, kids, fuck that. It's very interesting when we start having these conversations about setting up, you know, times for board meetings and stuff like that, where I'm just like, I can't, it's centered around, like my kid has this thing and you have these people just like, can't they watch themselves yet? Like, I'm just like, listen, like, it's hard. It's hard to have those conversations. So it sounds like, you know, some of the things that we would love to change are like, when when uh, 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 like setting up meetings or uh, I, I guess first one was having a space that is welcoming to children should they need to be there for however length of time. And two, when setting up meetings, perhaps rehearsals, perhaps tech, like being cognizant that like there are certain times of day that are very hard for parents. I mean, just the idea of like, oh yeah, and call time is at six. I'm like, oh God, okay. <laughs> like what goes into getting there at six o'clock? Well, that means that I need to get a sitter to get there probably by five because with traffic, I need to have enough space to get downtown, park the car, walk to where I'm getting, and then have a friggin' second. <laughs> to gather myself and even know what's going on. And this is not to mention like, do they need to be fed before I leave? Like explain if the sitter hasn't met your kids before, making sure they know who this is. Do, does the sitter know anything? <laughs> and you know, figuring all that out. And you know, the amount of emotional labor that goes into, and the amount of juggling that goes into taking care of your kids. Because, like, I mean, I have a partner who works full-time, but, like, I can't ask them to leave the office at 4.30. That's just not possible. So I need to find, you know, an hour and a half for someone to watch my kid. And I don't have family up here, so Grandma can't come. I'd love to hear, like, anything else. Like, Jazz, Faith. Hey, Lisa. Hi, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wanted to, I mentioned earlier um, that I wanted, that I was going to talk about Maggie Ensemble because when, when Nabra first asked me, I was like, oh yeah, I have stuff to say. Um, about 10 years ago, well, it'll be 10 years ago next, next season, we, a friend of mine in college started this vocal ensemble and it was, it started as like four or five of us just because we all had met at UW. We were getting um, graduate degrees in various musical ways. And um, and she wanted to start this group and we all were pregnant. 
<laughs> and she wasn't, but you know, like the people she wanted, her closest friends, people she could trust, people that she liked their voices. Um, and so we started the group and we kind of realized all, you know, we're all gonna sort of be in the same boat. So we had rehearsals at a house. And once we had the kids, like the partners came and we had, you know, like food together. So we didn't have to think about cooking. And then the kids all went in another room with the partners and we all sang and had a rehearsal. And that was just kind of how it went. And it, and then the kids grew up. My daughter's now 10. Um, so that was, um, you know, she, she was little and then has grown up in the ensemble that way. And so have all the other kids. And we had an incident. I don't know if it was, it was a kind of very cool event. And we were singing for um, the, a big, like all these choirs coming together at St. Mark's Cathedral. And so it was a huge, I mean, it was, it was being videoed and, you know, it was sold out. And one of our members, a new member, had her newborn with her and her partner was stuck in traffic and she had you know and then we were going to go on and the director was you know she's like what do i do and the director's like bring her on so we went on stage and she had the newborn like swaddled and in front of her and it was totally fine and also amazing and obviously she could have cried and that would have been an issue but it wasn't and she felt you know like you know somebody said oh just hand the baby over to this guy and she's like the baby who the baby doesn't know this guy i'm not gonna just hand my child over to some random oh person God. and does you that know? person is that person okay with that right, right and it was just i mean that was the direct the the director of you know whatever and and our director was like, no, that's not going to happen. It's fine. She's going to go on. And of course, it went um, <laughs> it went a little viral. So we had the video that went online and people were very like in the proper choral world. They were like, how dare you bring a child onto the stage? Wow. The response was antagonistic. Yes. I'm surprised because by that. Because it was, it's so, it's a lot of the choral world is so old fashioned. And so, I mean. <sighs> And it was a few songs, you know, it wasn't even a whole, it wasn't just us, you know, we were singing maybe three pieces. So it was a little bit of us and then other choirs coming on. And so it was, it was really incredible to have that, you know, response from people being like shaking their heads and just like oh, that group from Seattle, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but it's been like the Maggie ensemble, which um, is, has been a really important part of me going through motherhood and having the support where I could continue like the week after the month after I gave birth I could continue being a part of this I didn't have to leave you know and a lot of the other things I did I, I couldn't you know breastfeed and I couldn't do all these other things but in this group that was so supportive I could keep I could continue being a part a member and learning music and singing and so that was huge for me and I think you know imagining I grew up in theater I grew up singing musicals it's important to me so I assume that anyone that's in it it's important to them and would be important to their kids and so why not have a you know that's the opportunity where your children can be involved in it too you know if you're like having a rehearsal well i i work with youth theater northwest and how about youth theater northwest does a kids thing at the same time that i'm doing my thing so they can go and experience that in you know at their level and i can experience it at mine and if i'm hired to be in a show my kid gets free tuition for this you know or just things that that you can write in too those are my ideas yeah that's cool so basically for theaters or for organizations that have also a youth program how can those how can parents who are working in the adult land use the youth program as an activity that they can bring their kids to that's great what a great idea yeah yeah completely and i and i think about that in i just started a house concert series and i asked my artists um 
you know, do you, what do you think about having kids there? And that was a discussion, you know, it was like, well, this, we want this to be a listening audience. We want this to be, you know, so how do I provide space for parents that want to come see these shows? And, but also, you know, and, and starting a, a series where it's like the, the first act is for the kids and the second act, you know, that kind of thing. So. Jess, when you were at Inverse Opera, I know mm-hmm. I was thinking of Sarah Walt. Actually, I don't know if I'm allowed to say. I, I'm sure. No. She <laughs> I don't know if she would mind. I don't think Sarah would care. But Sarah yeah, yeah. Balsh had a baby in the middle of that rehearsal process. And I know she oh, like sings your praises of how accommodating you were because she, I mean, right in the middle, like, what are you going to do? Yeah. Well, I feel like this is the, uh, the other thing was you know, I was, I think it also depends on, are you in rooms with people who get it? Right. Cause I think in that case, like Sarah had me and Rob Scherzer, who's also killer parent also had Max in the room when Max was like this tall. And so it is about setting the example and setting the precedent Mm -hmm. of like, this is our priorities. And we had the honor to grow from a small company to a small company. And, um, (laughs) And it's easier to integrate your core values at the beginning, right? And it is harder for these large companies who have million dollar budgets to go, but we need every dollar. We need every dollar to just do what we're doing. And it, and they don't, and it's harder to then adjust and make the big whoop for like, what can this look like now? Where like the nimbleness of small companies. Yeah. I just praise because it's like, you can do what you want to do. You can assess, you can assign your values now so that as you grow, you know, I think that that's like, if I could start the world over again, I would go to each company when they're starting and being like, yo, in 20 years, you're going to be sad. You don't instigate these policies now and you don't make your space to welcoming now because when you're trying to readjust and resupport the 200 plus employees, it's going to be harder than if you learn how to do that at the beginning. So I think that's my thing is like, please try to learn how to like support people at the beginning of your organization. Um, yeah. And I think for me, you know, there are, there are things like I could make the list of like, here's how, where I see caregiver support getting, uh, really jumping up jumping up their game. Right. But for me, I think the overall cultural thing that I would love to see change is just that we talk about it more just like this Mm. and that people can see what caregiver support, how it lives out so that young people who are coming up within the industry know that being a caregiver within the industry is possible for them. Because what breaks my heart is that process. When you hit this wall and you've been focusing on this, you've been in this culture of I need to be grateful, right? I need to be grateful to get ahead rather than I could be thankful that I'm here and still tell you what I need in order to survive and exist, right? So if we can see the culture, that culture taken out and young people can say, I want to grow within this industry. I want to keep going. And it's possible to have a family, right? And it's possible to adopt. And it's possible for me to say, mama, move in with me. I got you covered, right? It's possible to be caregiver and still thrive in this industry. I think that that's what our job is right now to do for the next younger generation comes up is like, okay, we have to set the example so that people don't feel like it's a choice. People mm-hmm. don't feel like they have to choose my passion or a family. That's that's the thing that we have to get out of there. So it looks like to me, there are things that we get to do now, which are like creating a caregiver support fund and acknowledging that there are additional expe- expenses that come up in those emergency situations that both of you have already lined up, right? So how as an organization do we support and say, we know that you're going to have more unexpected expenses come up than most. So how can we provide a retainer so that when you have to make that choice, do I lose $50 today so that I can go do what I love? You actually don't have to lose $50 today. You know, how can we do that? And and I've been learning a lot in my research that there are organizations throughout the country 
that are specifically looking to give to theaters that are small, medium sized to support things like this. And so just like give a giant shout out to PAL, which is the Parent Artist Advocacy yeah. League, because they will hook you up with those resources and they've been such a great support to me. But then also like those, we work at the weirdest times y'all. Yeah. And how can we just set this up so that we align a little bit more with the way the world works, right? I also think of like value. I think I get that there has to be shows on Mother's Day and Father's Day. I get that it's a weekend, right? Faith space. I'm like, but do you? <laughs> but I'm like, what if you got parents in your cast? Can you give those parents, can you give those kids comps so that the parents, mm. so that they can be together without having to spend money? Like, what are, what are those things that you can do? I don't know. Um, I have a whole that's running so si- No, God, but Jess, that's so simple. And I think that, you know, I think people, when they come up against issues like how do we help parents, a wall comes out of like, well, we can't. That costs too much money. We can't do that. I'm like, okay, but comps for like, I mean, how many, how big is this cast? You know, comps for like, I'm just going to say 10 kids. You can't make that happen on Mother's Day or Father's Day. <laughs> I bet you have 10 empty seats. I, well, I'm I bet you about bigger theaters, especially. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, that's so simple. And that just shows like, hey, we, I see you. <laughs> and we got to do a thing. And maybe it's even a two show day. But like, your kids should come and be able to see you. And here you go outside of like the regular whatever. I mean, you know, like that's such a simple thing. I mean, I think um, Rachel Spencer Hewitt, who runs PAL, Um, one of the luminaries who run PAL, one of the things that she said was like, you know what? I bet you, you could find in your budget. She was like 500 bucks to give to a parent just during tech week. Would that not change your life? (laughs) Just tech. Because rehearsals like, you know, like that's, you know, that's at least the same. But tech, (laughs) you know, you don't know when, when you don't know until 1 a.m. what your schedule the next day is going to be. And that scheduling rodeo, like, my God. Yes, Halloween. Oh, my God. Someone just mentioned Halloween. The amount of times that I've skipped trick-or-treating with my kids because I was in a theater, like, (laughs) or, like, I I mean, I don't know. My kids are little. They're six. So, like, sometimes I'd be like, let's go to the mall at 2 p.m. And, like, they don't know any better. But, like, you know, but there's something fun about it being, like, kind of dark. And you want to see them. And you want to see all the other kids. And, like, you have to say no. Can I just jump in, Miss? Please, Sergeant? no, do. Because you know I have so much to say. Oh my God, I've been <laughs> I have waiting. So many feelings. I've been. Uh, first of all, I want to say, just piggybacking on Miss Jess, you put money towards what you value, right? That's where the money goes. So I would love to see normalizing, prioritizing family. Just make it normal. I want to piggyback on Miss Veronica. Humanize it. Uh, it's a, everybody came from a, the JJ, right? We we all did. So normalize it. The fact that the the people look down on the newborn or whatever, I say shame on them. So many feelings. Miss Miss Pucks of Plenty, um, yes, Queen. With you were too late with doing this this daycare thing. I say yes. Um, what I would do. And y'all are kind. I I would do what my mother has always said about politics. She said she would fire everyone in government and hire women in every position. That's what she would do. And that's what I say. I would take my Thanos glove and just click. And then all of the people without uteruses would just be gone because it's a normal thing. It should be a normal thing to, uh, (laughs) to support families. If those parents, are taken care of, they're going to produce for you. Happy parents, happy employees who have kids, support their creativity by taking that off their plate, supporting them, and they will give you whatever you need. I was spoiled um, when I first, first came into acting in the mid nineties. I started my career at Taproot Theater. Taproot Theater, was so excited, you guys, to have me on board this project. I had three littles, um, seven, five, and four, one of those with autism. They said, what do you need? I said, I have to bring my kids every once in a while because I was a housewife, y'all. So my spouse at the time was like, this is great. What are you going to do with the kids when you come to rehearsal? 
It's like, yep. ah, that's a, um, hmm, that's a question. Uh, he was supportive sometimes, but sometimes it was like, I can't do this. You know, I can't work all day and then have the kids, even though we do stuff like that all the time. But anyway, whatever, bygones. Um, so Taproot, let my kids come to rehearsals. Some of the people that work there live in an apartment above the theater. And so during some shows, they would go up and play with my kids. They made it absolutely normal. So of course, when I started working for the bigger theaters, I was like, well, this is just how it works. Yeah. <laughs> And um, Storybook Theater, run by Lonnie Brockman and uh, Sue Bardsley, both mothers, both with children, um, said, bring your kids. And one of my kids is here that I would I homeschooled and brought to rehearsals. And during her homeschool curriculum, I made stage managing one of her subjects. So the stage manager trained her and she literally three of my kids, all of them grew up in the theater. Um, the other thing I would do is, is I think it has to start from within that change. So the, the, the institution itself, anybody on that staff and leadership that's not down should not be a part of that. It, you shouldn't be able to just hang out there and cause problems. If you're going to be a problem, they should not be a part of your staff. Um, and I think partnership, as I think Jess talked about, Boys and Girls Club, you can partner with local daycare. You can, there's, there's teachers that could do classes at the grounds of your theater, even if you're not an institution with, with uh, that does that type of thing. There's all kinds of things that you can do to support families. It honestly is not hard. All you have to do is just value it and then you'll make a, a way to make it work. I'm done. I'm dropping the mic. That's it. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, I think that your budget is a moral document. That goes for literally every friggin' problem. <laughs> your budget is a moral document. If we have learned nothing else this year, where are you spending your money? Because that is what you believe in. Exactly. And what are the things you're saying? Okay. I mean, this is a, this is an inside out kind of issue. Yes. Uh, when we're talking about equity and inclusion and all those things, it should include how you treat women, um, those as they identify as women or have the uteruses, um, how do you treat them? How do you engage with them? There should be no shame in the fact that I can't be here. In fact, I just signed on to direct a show and I was given the schedule of what times things were and all of this. And I had to say, I am a single mom with an adult son with autism. So I need to call these shots. I need to let you know when these times are. I need to let you know when I'm available and if I can get a caregiver or not. So it should just be an automatic, oh, you're a parent, what do you need? That's what you need. Uh, what do you need? God, what a, again, this is a very simple question. What do you need? And you know, if you can't make it work, like, no, you know what I mean? Like, you know, Reba Theater Company, my company, like we are not an equity house. We don't have a venue. We're non-union. We do one show a year, <laughs> but like, you know, for me, when I start rehearsals, like I start them, like I start them at seven o'clock because that's just easier because that means I know that my kid is fed. I know that my spouse is home and I know that I, it's a little later. I'm not fighting traffic for an hour and then racing in and just moving that back. Very simple. Cause we still do rehearsals in the night. <laughs> you know, we don't have daytime rehearsal time because all of our artists have to also work during the day because we don't pay, we pay them a stipend, right? So just like, but some, and I do that because like when I am in a position of power as a, I don't know why I put quotes on that. When I'm in a position of power as a director and as an artistic director, like I get to make that decision for me. But when you're not in a position of power, like it's so hard to be like, could we not start at five? Or could you not like email me the day of and be like, we're going to start a half hour early. Hope that works. And you're like, no, it doesn't work. It does not work for me, you know? And again, it goes back to what Veronica was saying of like how we have this need to be like, absolutely, of course I will, because you can replace me easily as an actor, right? There's 400 billion of me, which is what we tell actors all the time, which is disgusting and horrible. Um, but that is the message, right? Well, I feel like the, the pandemic has shown us that how we can be human when we're all on the zoom 
And like, what was that classic where there was some, uh, I don't know, he, he was conducting a business or it was like a news anchor and like his little toddler oh, right. Ran like down. came in and then the like the the, yeah. the mom like pulled him out yeah. you know and he was so embarrassed and it was just terrible and and i just thought in my head like why do we need to be embarrassed why is yes. this terrible that he has a child you know i'm gonna make a leap and make a lot of assumptions but i bet you that this male person has never had to be inconvenienced by a child before because that was never that was something that that person was always protected from, and it is like I, as I mentioned before we went on, my kid is watching Doc McSevens in the next room, and if they suddenly turn up their volume during this, guess what, y'all? <laughs> That's what you're listening to. There's no like I am the person who would keep that from my spouse who works in tech upstairs. That's my job, right, as the primary parent. But when you are the primary parent. <laughs> No one is, oh, I'm so sorry. Nobody's doing that for you. And I think in theater, especially the primary parent, if you are privileged, like if you do have a partner, right? If you're the one in theater, you become the flexible one because your schedule is who knows what's he. And so you're suddenly flexible because you... And it's like, except you're entering into a space that has no flexibility and you have to be available whenever, and they actually have the set schedule and they actually have the grounding, but I'm the one who needs to, or the person with the flexible schedule has to be the one to adjust and take this. So I think that that is also a thing. That's a thing we internally within my family scope work on often. Um, but something that I'm also constantly aware of is, you know, the pressure of being, assuming I need as an arts administrator to assume that artists that I'm hiring are being forced into the flexible position and that they are the primary support rather than they have primary support. You know what I mean? That's like a, that's a compassion mindset as well. And a, and a, and an understanding. I don't know if I explained it well enough, but hopefully you understand that. Um, and I just also want to shout out to boys and girls club. They are always willing to create partnerships within communities. And like, I'm working on right one right now that I'm like really praying works out all the way, but I know oftentimes what happens is if you are lucky to work in an arts administration that has an education program, that just means that you're tied for space in such a stressful way <laughs> that you usually have a space issue where you can support education or you can support rehearsals, but neither at the same time. And there's opportunity there though. If you have rehearsals and you don't have space for education, partner with something like the Boys and Girls Club where they can offer you support and caregiving and you can offer them support and additional arts programming. And when I was, this is like way before Seattle. So this is a Jessica, none of y'all knew, but when I lived in San Antonio, I had the privilege of being part of the team that opened the, um, uh, the Mahalia Jackson in New Orleans after Katrina. And I was in charge of working up their, their theater services program and getting volunteers ready. Boys and Girls Club, they love to send their older students to volunteer usher at your organization because those kids then get to see theater and they get to experience it. So why don't you offer their students the opportunity to see live theater and experience theater? And they will also offer you support for your for your caregivers on your staff. It's like so symbiotic and you can continue your mission of encouraging younger folks to love the theater. So just invest in those partnerships, get creative. They're there. There are community members that already exist that want to do this stuff. That's such a great idea. I want to throw one idea out and then I'm going to I'm going to pick on Sarah because we haven't heard from her yet. So get ready. Um, <laughs> so uh, another idea um, that I've heard a couple of times is, for example, and this can be done at any level of theater, again, because your budget is a moral document. So auditions. How long do you spend in an audition? Two minutes? Three minutes? How long does a parent need to, like, they have to figure out a way to prep for their audition. They have to get all their stuff in the car. They have to drive away, park, go to the thing, come back, wait, because maybe they're behind, maybe they're whatever. And that is like, what, like an hour and a half? 
if you've ever tried to get a babysitter for an hour and a half at three o'clock, it's impossible. It does not exist. It's not true. <laughs> it's not a thing. Um, so what if you had a theater company that said, we have, I mean, and this is a pre COVID idea there. Will be, I'm sure there are other ways, but what if there was a theater company who also, I mean, I'm thinking about TPS here in Seattle. There's a, um, theater group that basically, uh, uh, um, runs a bunch of studios and you can rent people can rent them what if you rented an extra room and you hired two or, there are actors who nanny <laughs> and would be more than happy if you had two or three of them and even if you just paid them and no one brought their kids and they just sat in that room on their phone and you just happened to pay actors you know whatever a <laughs> hundred bucks each that's still a mitzvah so that's nice but if you told parents, by the way, bring your kid, drop him off in the room next door, we've got crayons and a whatever, so that you can sing for two seconds and then put the kid back in the car. Oh my God. I mean, I've done that for other parents. They'd be like, I have an audition. Can you just come with me and like sit in the hall with the stroller and do this? And I'll do that for you next time. Like, great. <laughs> Like, imagine, like, if you just, like, walked him in the stroller, like, this is their nap time, they're just gonna sleep, and if that, there's the big camp guy, I'll be right back. I mean, that is such a simple thing. That is so simple, and just relieves, and you know what? You're gonna get more people who are gonna be willing to come out. Think of who you are missing out on. Because someone does not have access to your auditions, because the burden of figuring that out, it's gonna keep people from... It's going to keep artists from you. And don't you want new artists? So, like, you're the brain trust theater companies. Like, figure it out. All right. Sarah. So, you, we got a little bit of your background. You were basically raised in the back of a theater. Yeah. Like, what for you as a kid who grew up in theater, from that perspective, I also, I also was a kid. My parents were in film, so it was a little bit different. Um, my mom was a, um, was in soaps back in the day when they used to film them live. Um, so I was always in the green room, like eating donuts with the other actors. And I just remember them with their like smocks on. So they didn't get powdered sugar. So I get it. It's a little bit different. Um, but that being said, like what for you as a kid growing up, like, did you see of like, man, I wish <laughs> more than anything, like, what would you have wanted to see that felt, made you feel like you were welcomed and not a problem. Right. I know it's very interesting. I'm so appreciative to be a part of this conversation because I am a child of this, of the outcome of this. Like I am your, your children's future pretty much of like how they, you know, did, but for us, it was very, we could only hope. Right. Well, <laughs> lingo. Uh, but it was, uh, it's funny because like I had a great childhood. I never thought twice about it, but we went everywhere. Like sometimes I look back and I think like, I don't know how you, you did it in the sense of during the day we'd go to the zoo and we'd, we'd play, we'd do stuff and then we'd go to rehearsal in the evening and it was like, you're going to go hang out with Sean and Catherine. And it'd be like, great, I love Sean and Catherine. Like they let us play with toys or they they like let us read these weird books and I don't know, you know, they're big words. I don't know what they are, but they let us. <laughs> Faith! I was like, wait. <laughs> I was like, no, that's, you know, not like weird, but, but like, you know, when they just give it like, they didn't have children. So it's like, what do you do with children that you don't have yourself, you know? Um, and we had so much fun. I had a blast being a child and a product of theater. I do. I mean, I grew up into it. I don't actually know life without the arts. I, I've never lived it. I can't imagine it. Um, and to me, it never felt like a struggle. And that, you know, I feel like a lot of that is my mother, Miss Faith Bennett Russell, making it not feel that way for us. If there's any pressure on her, I would have never known and never felt it because I just got to spend more time with mom, um, which was great. And even growing up, we did a lot of um, Studio East and Storybook Theater. And I would be in shows and I would trade off and, and teach and assist camps or go with her to camps. During the, I was, I mean, I also just loved to be there. I would just hang out for hours and be quiet in the corner. Um, but there were those trade offs. Those things do exist. But I do think that it is a lot of those smaller companies, especially, you know, run by people with families who know those setups where you can do trade. And it's like, I will trade, you know, if, if my mom is directing a show for them, I get less tuition on a show that I'm doing or less tuition on a class. Or they would ask me to assist a class during the summertime. And during summer, I'd always have internships 
in theater and I was always doing stuff because they offered me the opportunities. And that is the, the difference of offering and extending the opportunities and thinking about if we want this person to teach and be a, a part of this, we have to offer them something that is worth it to them and their family. And that is, I, I agree with so much of what everyone has said of that is the missing piece, the empathy, the being able to put yourself in someone else's situation, even whether you have kids or not, like, don't you remember you were a child? Like, did we forget we all had to be children at one point and need our parents for life, you know? So where is that disconnect? Um, and I, I, a lot of the talking I was thinking a lot about, I've been really fortunate to be able to do public works with um, Seattle Rep. And one of my favorite parts, of course, is also a pre-COVID life, is they would have community dinners and there would be people who would volunteer to have food and we had kids you know in the show people had families and we would all come together beforehand and eat and commune and then go our separate ways so my thought is too is like why don't we do that more in theater why don't we actually build community especially if we're all working in the same region if we're all see each other a lot of the time why don't we do these things that then it's like let's have a meal if rehearsal has to be at six can't we provide a meal, have a potluck, at, like come anytime between five and six with your family, you get a meal, they can hang out. And then you know what, afterwards, your kids are going to go with teacher Sarah, and you're going to teach a class. Because I also think about how there's so many teaching programs here. There are always students who need volunteer hours. There are always people who want to learn and want to take those things on. So can we partner with like UW teaching? Can you partner with other places? Can you partner with your education department and say, hey, we are looking for people who need more experience to do teaching from six to 10 or seven to 10, you know, with, with the kids and you'll help them with homework or we'll have a couple people come. You know, if, if we have these education programs or things, why can't we just translate copy and paste? To me, that makes sense, you know, or like Boys and Girls Club, like how can we the trade-off doesn't seem that hard to me because I I did it. I worked, I was able to be at these places that were like, yes, yeah, so you're gonna teach a class or like you're gonna assist a class. And I learned I'm definitely who I am today because of that nurturing. And I use that all the time in my tech job. Like I'm work as a front desk host, you know, right now. And it's like, oh, I use these theater skills for life. You are helping your kids when they get to be a part of these programs. So how can we do that? as a whole like uh elisa like i love that you were like yeah like let's partner with these places like i think jeff said it too and it's like yeah like why i i don't understand why we don't partner with the or like even thinking of auditions like i personally don't have kids so i don't have to think about it and it's a pain in the butt for me to have to drive downtown and park i couldn't imagine having to think of another child or i have because you know i will help with my brother and watch him if my mother needs it and i'm able to but even though a lot of times I'm not able to because I have such a busy schedule and it's like, I wish I could support you, but like I'm in this 10 out of 12. Like, why am I, why am I here 10 hours of the day? That is a great question too, you know? Um, so I just, yes and to everyone. And I'm very grateful to listen to this conversation and to also see how I can be an advocate for these changes as well, because I think it's easy out of sight, out of mind. I don't have children. It's not my problem, but it is my problem because I am a daughter, I am a sister, I am an artist, I am an ally for many things, and I should be an ally for parents as well, especially because a lot of dope people and artists are parents, and it's like, I want to play with you, I want <laughs> to record with you, so like, like Jasmine, one day we will do something. Oh man, it's going to be good. <laughs> I want to advocate for you and say like, yeah, how do we get... A teacher or like who do I know who can help volunteer you know to then have a class or just even have a trade-off where it's like you'll be here for two hours and someone else will come in for two hours you know oh I, I love that Sarah thank you like the idea that I think that it's very in vogue especially amongst theater people and probably amongst like the younger set to be like ew kids are dumb and kids are gross and I hate children and like that's like not actually cool <laughs> like, hating children is, like, not something that, like, makes you good. I don't know why I have to say that, but I do. I see it a lot. And I'm like, like, ew, why would you bring your kid in public? I'm like, <laughs> on a plane, on a bus, in a restaurant. Like, I mean, again, this is the, back in the old days. Um, but 
like because they're a part of life they're a part of public life and i'm not saying that you have to and i think that it's a reaction to the hurt that people feel when they feel pressured to have children and i get that but that's not me and that's not my kids and so you know i think that you know to sarah's point like you anyone can be an advocate anyone you know let's all take care of each other we're like we're all a part of this community right i had you know the uh, um uh, the honor, really, to work as an assistant director um, on uh, the musical Bliss, which was at the Fifth Avenue, and my director, Cheryl Collar, um, is a mother. Her kids, she has three daughters, they're all grown up, but she had, she and she chose to take, like, I don't know, like 15 years off in the middle of her career to raise her kids, and then came back into the game at 40 in New York, and then was nominated for a Tony Award. So like, eh. So basically, I admire her. I think she's freaking brilliant and wonderful. And she knew that I had kids. We were rehearsing in New York, which meant I had to leave my family to go work with her. And I, I <laughs> we can talk about what I had to do to make sure that that worked, but I did it. And when we came back to Seattle to start pecking, you know, we would be, and because I was an assist, I wasn't an associate, I was an assistant, which means that you're nothing to a lot of people. Um, everyone was very nice to me, but like, you know, you're, you're farther down the ladder than others. So when we're at like, you know, one, two in the morning on tech, and again, I'm back home. So that means I, like, I, my full-time parenting duties resumed, even though I was, dur it was during tech. And, you know, the lighting designer's like, I need someone in here at 8 a.m. so that I can, I just need someone to stand on stage so I can focus and I don't want to call the actors in because they're out of hours and blah, blah, blah. And the lighting designer was like, let's just make Jasmine do it. And I immediately was going to be like, yes, of course I can do it. I'm game to do that. Okay, so to get to the theater at 8 a.m., that means I have to find somewhere for the kids to be by 7.30 in the morning. It's 2 a.m. now. I have five and a half hours, and I'm doing this in my head while I'm saying, absolutely, I will be there. How oh, I? And Cheryl was like, absolutely not. Jasmine has children. We'll find someone else. The director said that. And I was like, thank you. I mean, it makes me emotional. Like, someone took care of me. You know, I'm 36. <laughs> I'm, I'm a 36 assistant year old assistant director with two little kids. Like, how many chances do you get to work with someone who is Tony nominated at a theater like the Fifth Avenue? And I didn't want to say no. And she took care of me because she'd been there. And how many parents at that level have been there? Not a lot. And that's this is part of this problem. And it goes back to what Jess was saying, which is like, Start now. Start now so that pucks with an 11-year-old, you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't have to be like, oh, yeah, that sounds friggin' great. <laughs> Glad you caught up, you know? Like, enough of that. And how great that, like, people like pucks and people like Cheryl Cowler are now, like, in positions where it's like, that's not how it happens in my house. That's not how it goes. You know, Faith as a director can be like, no, I don't do that. That's not how it happens, you know? Like... Like, Elisa can be like, no, that's not how it happens in my choir. And if, like, there's no one to watch your baby, you'll bring them on stage. And if you have something to say about it, you come and talk to me. You know, think, like, more of those people. I feel like caregiver support is something, like, that just doesn't get talked about until you need it. Ooh. Right? I remember, like, that hitting me really hard when I was like, okay, I want to have a family now. And it came down for time for salary negotiations. And I was also like, let's go ahead and ask remind me what your maternity leave or your parental leave is. And maybe I can wrap that into some negotiations. And I just had a moment where I was like, why have I never asked about this before? Why have I never, why, when I am hired at a place, was I not trained to ask when I wasn't thinking about being a caregiver, tell me about your caregiver support plans when I wasn't a caregiver, right? So that's my thing is like, we have to start training people to think about it when they aren't in the situation where they need it. So I remember calling my mentor from college, why didn't you ever tell me to blah, 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 ask this question? And she was just like, well, cause I mean, it's just what I had to do and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, 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 no more. Like, I don't want any more of that. So I tell, I told my teach the kids I taught in high school this year, I was like, 
ask about these things whenever you go to work someplace. And maybe by asking, we will show them that we need it. And if the younger generation keeps going and you need, and you ask before you need it, like maybe that will help too. I don't know. I have so many, I have so many thoughts. Um, and I, I think, I don't know how many of you know, like in the work that I do, there's so much that I do that is about marrying value to structure. Like what is the actual execution of the things that you say that you're, that you're, that you put value around. And one of the things that I heard pretty consistently here that I experienced for myself as a, um, a parent is um, the more regular of a schedule you can offer for people, the easier it gets. So, um, and, and specifically I'm thinking about, you know, I was a stage manager my husband, um, was a stage hand. Um, this whole, like, you'll come in at 11, you'll come in at nine, you'll be here till 10, you'll be here till six, whatever it is. Like it is, it's hard on a human being to begin with, to do that, to then have to integrate tiny human beings who like, don't, who like are, are still figuring out what their structure is within the world. It's impossible. It's impossible. And then like, you know, Jasmine, as you keep talking about, like having to then integrate caregivers into this too, like the more structure you can offer to parents, to, to people, period, from the outset, it, it, it just, it makes things so much easier. So like, and um, so my, my husband, um, when my son was born, um, he was a year and a half when my, my husband was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. And we went through that whole thing until he, he died a year and a half ago. And I will never forget that when the time finally came that we were like, we can't, like, you can't be working a stagehand schedule anymore. You can't be working these, you know, 12, 14, 16 hour days. And the rep was able to make it so that way he was only in the building from eight to five, like Monday through Friday or Tuesday through Saturday or whatever. The possibilities that suddenly opened up for us to spend time as a family were just like exponential. So when I think about the regularity of scheduling of like give people a sense of what their structure is because that's like that's what creates emotional safety that's what creates mental safety and then also like literally makes your workplace safer because then people can like plan shit around and they're not trying to figure out like how to how to fit in this thing into this other thing or they're not at like Jasmine at two o'clock in the morning trying to figure out how she I mean truly truly so there's the regularity of schedule that I heard. And then um, it, it, within that also, I'm like, I remember when I got the very lucky experience of getting paid standby pay um, and it happened a million years ago, but this was when they were like, okay, we want you to keep your schedule open from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. We're gonna pay you for every one of those hours, but we're, we're gonna call you in when we're gonna call you in. And it was life-changing. It was life-changing to have that because then I was like, okay, well, I know I'm going to get paid for 14 hours every day, but then the, 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 um, stage management and directing staff had the, had the freedom to sort of then choose where they still wanted people. But the, the belief was like, you're already paying people to be available 9.30 to 6.30, 8 to midnight, whatever it is, like actually honor that you are asking people to hold out that time in their lives so that when they do have to make the last minute flex and they can only find the sitter who is paying $25 an hour, then they have that cushion there. And then like, and then like the last thing that I just kept thinking of is um, within the, within the theater community itself, right? Like I had my child, um, he was, he came early. And so Andy ended up just taking off work. Um, he was supposed to work um, a summer show. He didn't work the summer show. We were very lucky that the rep was willing to um, bend some rules <laughs> to make, to, so that way Andy could use his sick pay to stay home with me and Ronan, which was great because it was the off season. So technically they shouldn't have, that, that like wasn't allowed, but like also they're like, we can, we'll do whatever we need to do. That was great. Um, so companies that can make those kinds of flexibilities, like where you can, like, even if they're in the off season, like trying to give people the benefits that they have banked, they just might not be on contract to use is a huge thing. And then even within that, I didn't know how much my community supported me until I was in like the most, the highest state of emergency, right? Like my husband was diagnosed with stage four cancer. We started chemotherapy immediately. I had a, I had a year and I, I had a, a, a 17 month old and people mobilized, like they mobilized for me in a way that I, I didn't even know was, was possible. And so when I think about that, one of the things that I, I, it took me and is still taking me time to figure out like, 
it's not, it's not a transactional thing. People didn't show up for me expecting that at some point I would pay them back down the line. So what would be really cool is in this industry where we claim that we are communal and we support each other and we're all in this together, wouldn't it be really cool if you just supported your community before the emergency happened, before someone was dying, before someone was like widowed? I don't know. I don't know, guys. It's just a thought just a thought, like, don't wait for the emergency to be building your network. And conversely, like, we all, can, we all can be paying into that, like, um, that, that, that system that helps the people so that we even before the emergency happens, they already know who they can turn to. Because I swear that was the thing that, that changed for me, going from a cancer caregiver to a widow was knowing that I already had this, this network set up, that when the time came for me to be like, I can, I am, I am in over my head. I cannot, I cannot be with my child for another minute. I need someone to please come and take him and take care of him so I can have a break. So I can probably literally just go cry in a corner. That there were people there who were ready to go. But it would have been really cool to know that that existed before we were in this stage of like everything being on fire. And then I could have just had time with my family before we knew that my husband was dying, before we had to deal with like all of the stuff that happened. So like, take care of each other, please. I've always felt like there should be a hospitality coordinator in the theater. And sorry for your Hi. loss, Veronica. Thank you for sharing that. So sorry for your loss. Um, just to piggyback on that, um, I was at another forum similar to this, and, and I shared that if there was a person hired to check in with things like that, that that's just their job. Moms, how are you doing? Um, you who change your pronouns and people aren't getting it right, how are you doing? You who are going through a crisis, how are you doing? That way, again, it's mission statement and vision. Um, and what Sarah said about community, uh, hospitality is a huge thing for me and feeling safe in whatever community you're in. And so if there was a hospitality coordinator or a concierge of some sort, um, whose job it was just to make sure people were okay. And I, I also think in, when you're hiring a family, a person with a family, maybe for that tech week, and I think maybe Jasmine already said that, it should be in your contract to have a, a stipend for childcare. If they can't provide it for you on site, then it, you should get an extra whatever for that. And that negotiate that coordinator would be like, "What do you need? How's it going? Do you need a meal? You look kind of peaked because you came right from home with your kids. We're just gonna have them hold for five more minutes. So make so I'll make sure that you eat and go to the bathroom. I just think that would be so valuable. That's I'm just gonna jump in really quickly. That's something Faith that I talk about a lot with my clients. It's like where where can you as an organization spend a dollar that that save someone else five or ten dollars and things like hmm. coordinated meals coordinated child care like co like coordinated this is why group health care plans are so powerful right because like you're paying one dollar that someone out on the open marketplace would have to pay three dollars for so the the power of recognizing that like you have the ability that even though it costs you an organization one dollar it saves all of those people their six dollars each and then suddenly everyone is so much happier and so much more relaxed and then can actually be creative because they're not dealing with like all of the basic humanity things that they need which includes knowing the kind of state that your family is in when you show up to rehearsal that's so good it reminds this is i i have a this is not a fully formed thought so feel free to shut me up <laughs> Um, so this reminds me, there's a, um, a Seattle luminary named Kathy Shea. I don't know how many people who are not from Seattle who are watching this, but Kathy Shea is ours and we love her. Um, <laughs> so, um, she actually had does like nationwide talks, but in any case, um, uh, but she does so much, um, anti-racist work in the arts. That's like, she's a queen. Um, and one of the things that we've talked about, like me and other artistic directors and other leaders in the Seattle theater community have talked about is, you know, how can we um, decolonize how we think about doing theater so that we can better support other, by, uh, and specifically by we, I mean white-led theaters, better support BIPOC-led theater orgs. And what it always comes down to is the money. I don't have the money. We can't take the money. If I do, I did. I can't. Oh, do but all of that, like hemming and hawing, which is understandable. But Kathy was like, "Who said money? <laughs> no one said money. 
you said money because that's what like white supremacy and capitalist thinking that's the first thing that comes up is money because that is how you are valuable right because i mean i know like for me like Remo doesn't have any like we don't have paid staff <laughs> You know, like I'm, I don't get paid. Nobody gets paid. So I'm like, God, like I'm, and I say all the time, like, I feel embarrassed to ask people who I know deserve to be paid to do things for me when I cannot pay them their worth. And again, to go back to Kathy saying like, you can give something to someone that isn't just money that adds value. And I think that when it comes to parenting, like to like, I want to, like, mesh those together. Like, you know, just the act of someone being, saying, again, it gets back to that very simple thing. What do you need? Do you just need someone to, like, meet you at the door with a banana? <laughs> Anyone can do that. And I get the banana costs money. But whatever. I don't know. Maybe you have an apple tree in your backyard. But whatever. Like, you know, we can break that down later. But you know what I mean? Like, how, you know, hey, can I, like, do you just need 10 minutes? I'll just tell the director you need 10 minutes. So that you don't have to, like be put in the position of having to ask for that. I can see you need that. Would you like me to ask that for you? No problem. Go do what you need to do. You know, like that is something that is just caring for someone else. Right. Well, you know? that makes me think too, like as everyone's talking, um, it's so interesting that we are in a career, whether it's burlesque, whether it's theater that reflects life, that asks questions about life, but has very little respect or, re or, or, support for real life where it's like you want me to emulate these things and and ask make people ask questions and feel but you also can't let me take a day off to go to my best friend's wedding you can't let me take time to go like someone said in in the chat about a, a breastfeeding or thinking about how my costume might be different because i'm pregnant or because i just had a baby like it is unfathomable for you to think of those things yet we're doing a show about families or about life about weddings about love about loss but you can't imagine how to support that like that really doesn't make sense to me especially listening to all of you talking it's like i really i mean i know this is slightly different but like i have had lost friendships or lost connections because i couldn't take a day off for the wedding and it's like i'm sorry that i am I'm a slave to my job. Like you make me feel like I am one in a million, but this pandemic has proven that we are not, that you actually cannot survive without us. You have nothing without your performers. And it's learning, living in that power, learning to advocate for what you need and finding the supports for that. And having, being able as a group and as a community to say, we will not stand for it any longer because you actually need me. And maybe there is someone who is willing to do it for nothing and doesn't care about those things. But do you actually want someone like that in your community and to build something, you know? And it just like, just hearing all of this, I'm like, wow, it just blows my mind for the work that we all do and what we give to people. How many people have said, oh yeah, I do miss theater. I miss seeing you on stage. But it's like, if you actually, you know, we don't actually have to be starving artists. Like, why, why is that a part of it? Why, we don't have to do that, especially when some of y'all are making so much money on the back end. But you, I don't know. I mean, maybe this is a hot take or something, but your job is to get me here. So, like, why can't you support me here? You know? And it's so, I don't know. That, that was just, I was, I was like, listen to y'all. I'm like, yeah, we, we are emulating real life, but why aren't we supporting real life? Yeah, that's so good. I love that, Sarah. Thank you. I think it all goes back to what Faith says, which is just like, let's just fire everybody and restart. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm ready. I'm jumping on board the Faith train. I've always been a fan. I'm ready to get on board. Um, I also just want to offer that in the vein of right dollars to spend and that fear of like, oh my gosh, but we have to build up money. And the idea of like, can you just show up with a banana? I need something just to offer. This is you can have a rehearsal room and instead of taking a five or a 10 in the middle of the day, you can take a 20 so that a parent can go and call and check on their families or pump or pump. And also you can adjust everybody's schedule so that one person can pump and everybody will appreciate it. 
right? I just want to say that like, that's a reality. And if you're curious on how to make like that space available, you need to start with having that space available. Don't try to find the space. Don't try to find the family space when you have the need arise. Even all theaters right now, where is that space? You might not have somebody knocking on your door with that need, but you need to know right now and you need to make it feel safe and comfortable and welcoming because you think that the rehearsal rooms needs to be safe, comfortable, welcoming. Have you ever tried to pump? So it needs to be a safe, comfortable, healthy space where people can relax, right? It does not need to be a closet with a chair in it, with no circulation. That is unacceptable. And I just want to offer that directors like uplift what Faith said about an empower, like taking the agency and saying, this is how I run my space. If you've signed me on, this is what, this is the community and this is the environment you sign on to like pair that with Sarah's, like we have the power. You can't actually do anything without your artists at any level. So like using the agency, I think is I'm like, I'm all for that. Find that. That's beautiful. And, um, oh gosh, yes. Just uplift all of this. I want to just share really fast before we I don't know how much time we have because I've lost, but <laughs> we have like 10 minutes. we're in the like, if any, incidentally, <laughs> I know we put it in the chat. If anyone has questions, like put them in the chat, but we'll keep talking if you um, let us. <laughs> Parent Artist Advocacy League PAL teaches what's called compassion training courses, where they will actually come in and teach leaders how to lead with a mindful <laughs> Mindful for mindful support for caregivers and next stage, which is a uh, free programming mirroring kind of similar to what Nopper does here with this, um, that uh, Deidre Woods and I co-produced over at Village Theater will be hosting a two hour caregiving compassion training uh, for leaders and anybody who wants to come and it's free. And so if you want to think about how can I redo my rehearsal schedule so that it supports caregivers, what are those small free things as a leader of a room that I should be considering as a stage manager, as a director, as an arts administrator, as anybody who cares about the other caregivers in their room and just wants to know how they can advocate for them. Um, I'll share that link with Navar so that she can share it with everybody but it's free. It's the experts teaching us how to do this. I'm excited to listen and learn because even though I'm a parent, I know I could do it better. So just to offer that as another opportunity to learn. Thank you. Um, and I, just to, to start to usually we'll, we'll uh, have kind of a town hall portion, but we have a small audience here. I at least wanted to share what Molly Classen uh, said in the chat. Uh, which folks have been responding to, but for those who can't see our chat, uh, the industry also needs to acknowledge the special needs of breastfeeding or chest feeding parents in terms of scheduling breaks and costuming for actors and be able to offer those things without a caregiver needing to ask since it can feel like such an uncomfortable or controversial subject, or at least make it known that those accommodations are expected, ex expected and acceptable. Um, and if there are other uh, caregivers, uh, family members in the uh, Zoom room, please do share your thoughts in the chat or your questions um, and we'll share it, uh, make sure to share it in these last few minutes. But along with what Jess just shared, I would love to make space um, uh, as well for anything else like that is coming up for folks, um, any other um, you know, spaces that you want to shout out. Um, I know Mix Pucks has their burlesque space that is, uh, that y'all should have to keep your eyes out for that is opening back up. So also giving space for y'all to shout out uh, what you want to shout out your children as well and bring them into the room if you'd like to. Um, and we'll close out soon. I keep thinking about, um, the word community, it gets used so, so much to the point that when I hear the word, my stomach actually tightens up um, because I don't think it means what people think it means, like when they use the word. So um, we've been using this phrase community nourishment a lot um, for the space, surrounding the space and like putting into the space what you want to see come out of it. And like, so there's a few of us on this on the team that are that are parents 
and like we discovered that we get an office this office space and i thought oh it's going to be the size of like a five by ten little closet and it's actually like a really big office and the first thing i said is well we're totally bringing our kids here right like this is where the kids are going to go right um so that's been really interesting and like like you know we have folks on the team who are like you know um closer to my son's age than they are to my age and uh because black don't crack, so no one really knows how old I am. Um, but um, it's it's really interesting because at first they were just like, "What? Why?" And I'm like, "Cause our kids need to be here." And like, you know, I don't want I don't want a board member or because right now it's a working board. I don't want anyone to be like, "Well, I can't come to help clean up the space, or I can't come to rehearsal, or I can't come to these things that we have to do because I can't find a sitter." Like that's that's a no. And like we got way too many too many tablets and fun things for kids to get into that we can put in that office space, feed and water them, and they're going to be just fine. Um, and then one of us is going back there and checking on them. But yeah, we're, we're really excited about the space. It's it's really cool. Um, our first show is uh, June twelfth. It's uh, Queer Prom Seattle, and this is our third year. It's a hybrid event, so it's virtual with some in person stuff. And it's a fundraiser for um, a festival that I founded and, and co-produced called What the Funk, an all people of color burlesque festival. It is the only one of its kind in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, we're the only all people of color burlesque festival in the Pacific Northwest right now. And uh, it is a tribute to the black American art form uh, music genre funk. And we're really, really excited. And we're proud to announce that we'll be doing that festival at the Triple Door, which as far as I know, will be one of the first times they've had an all BIPOC production on their stage. Oh, that's so cool. It's so cool. I wanna know if it exists at all, Miss Puck, a sensory friendly burlesque. Cause I have an adult son with autism who might think all the fanfare is awesome. Uh huh. But you know, the- yeah, I do yeah. know. My, my kiddo has autism. Oh, okay. Yeah. We got to talk. We do. Yeah. I'm just I, saying for the future, that might be, I mean, I think every organization should have a sensory friendly production, even if there's one. Everyone should have ASL. I'm just saying. We but, should talk um, about that. I would love to hear more about that because that would be amazing. Uh, two members of our board are actually um, autistic. And so, and then one of my partners is autistic. So it's it's something that has come up and is really near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a sex educator on top of all of this. And a lot of the work I've been doing recently is in disability justice um, and making spaces um, more accessible just in general. And so, yeah, I would yeah, love- Yeah, I'm gonna put my info in the chat to you right now. I'm just cool. saying we're gonna talk. Yes, please. <laughs> well, can we also just say spaces that aren't accessible for children like that aren't easy for children to come into and the rehearsal halls that i've been a part of like that or the productions that i've been a part of as a stage manager they're terrible shows they're inevitably terrible shows because there is this like sense of play that isn't as allowed so like if you if you're if you have if you're creating an environment whether it's your administrative offices or your rehearsal halls or your your space between shows for for your crew members kids or whatever that isn't actually accessible to children like there's a good chance people aren't having fun doing what they're doing and so i i i mean i have lots of stories about that but like that's the bottom line to me is like anytime i think about the shows that i've been a part of that or like workplaces in general, any of the other workplaces that I work with that are not arts organizations where children are this like big controversial thing. It's like, ooh, it is so toxic in here that like this, this actually, this place should just be shut down is what needs to happen at this point. We need to burn it all down and start over. But if you have an environment that's welcoming to children, that's welcoming to the people who are caring for children, inevitably you have to invite in a sense of play because that's what kids are doing like and curiosity. So I would just say like, if you are doing examination on your um, organization, whether you're an arts organization or anything else, and you're like, oh yeah, we're not really friendly to kids. There's probably bigger stuff going on about how your environment operates and what what kind of like uh, the space for experimentation that you might be allowing and not allowing as a result. Veronica, can you plug your incredible business? Yeah, um, uh, what is it called? Oh, Wilhelm Consulting. <laughs> and my last name is- It's your name. <laughs> 
H-E-L-M. And um, I do mostly organizational development work. I do a lot of work with leaders who are trying to figure out like what their impact should be on the on the world. Um, I've worked with Jasmine both within Reboot and then just with them in coaching. Um, <laughs> Jess has been subjected to one of my trainings. So ask them <laughs> if you have questions. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I, I love the work that I do. So um, call me, I have some spaces open. <laughs> Thank you. Can, and can I that, plug Bushwick really quick? I yes, guess. yes. I was going to say, yeah, I don't actually <laughs> to as well. Please. Oh, sweet. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. so I'm the development director for Bushwick Northwest, which is Bushwick Book Club. Um, and we are, we hire artists to write songs that are inspired by books. And our other half is style songwriting for youth literature education. And we go into the schools and teach kids how to write songs based on the literature that they're reading in their curriculum. It's pretty badass. And um, we have our show on Saturday night. I hope that you can come to it uh, the 22nd. And the book is Angela Garbez's Like a Mother, which is um, all of you would love. But Navra and I have talked about that everybody, you know, some people avoid it because they think it's for mothers only. And it's really not. It's for everybody else. Um, I also wrote a choral piece and the Maggie Ensemble is singing in it. So all my worlds are colliding in this concert. Um, it's going to be really cool. And then Navra, you can talk about the rep part of it. Yes, and we will be featuring some monologues from different productions we've put on at the rep uh, about motherhood uh, to add some theatrical flair to that concert. And Faith Russell will be performing a couple monologues. So seeing that side of Faith as well is just a joy. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Really, it's been such a pleasure to talk to y'all. It's incredible. There's so much more to talk about. Uh, I, I know the Village's event that we'll be sending out to everyone who registered will be a place to continue this conversation, but please continue it in your theaters, in your organizations, in your rehearsal spaces, with your families, um, with everyone you can, you can get to talk about it, who can get to, you can get to listen. That's, uh, as we talked about, part of, part of uh, the culture change. Uh, so thank you for coming and have a lovely evening. Thank you so much. And thank you to our panelists. God, what a good combo. Thanks for having us.